Hello, welcome to the Future is a Mixtape. This is Jesse. I'm Matt. And I think we unintentionally stumbled onto a new genre here in our <laughs> long-winded discussion of inventing the future, post-capitalism in a world without work by Nick Cernick and Alex Williams. Kind of have here a uh, cliff notes for instead of getting the book on tape. You just pod listen. cliffs. <laughs> yeah. We call them pod cliffs. So <laughs> if you don't like reading academic-y books, <laughs> then we actually, in, in about uh, an hour plus, we will... Go ahead and give you the entire book, yeah. um, chapter to chapter, and so you actually don't even have to read the book, and you've gotten most of the main points. <laughs> yeah, pretty much cover it all in a very lengthy way on this cliff one. pods. <laughs> we we'll call them cliff pods. Strap in for this long discussion of this very important text. You'll need black tea and cocaine to get through this, <laughs> but hopefully you enjoy it. Cheers. We know we're successful at work when we, we don't even realize we're working. I think that's actually the way we should think about work is that, you know, that famous quote that the, the authors from the Inventing the Future cite from Karl Marx is, you know, and it's been cited forever in social circles that I hunt in the evening, fish in the afternoon, and I chat about politics at, at, at the evening, but I'm neither uh, an economist, a hunter, or a fisher, fisherman, right? You mixed that. You've got them. Well, I'm, I'm going from memory. You used the evening twice there. I, I did I use evening twice. Um, but, you know, the, the main idea, of course, is that, that we are all of multiple identities. So work should be something where it's just living, right? And it, it's not something that's considered a burden. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I, I, I actually genuinely do enjoy teaching. It's an in- t- incredible pleasure to have autonomy and mastery. Yeah. And being a college teacher where you're not... You know, trapped in the whole of Common Core and standardized ma- masturbation for testing. You know, you're you actually have course curriculum freedom, at least in my department, and so you actually can design the books, the assignments, and you actually have autonomy and mastery. But I think the the idea is, of course, that that work shouldn't be a burden, and we don't even acknowledge it as work. So there's massive levels of unnecessary labor, right. which are kind of prison communes of right. some sort, some weird kind of uh, Mars landing where you have to do mine work. Mm-hmm. It's some bad 1980s science fiction film. So, I mean, and I generally feel a kind of uh, work guilt because my job is meaningful and the vast multitude of people I see at the LA's Union Station or on the train are not involved with meaningful work. Yeah. <laughs> that shit needs to be automated <laughs> like a motherfucker. Yeah. The, this, is, this is a real thing. This is a, the envy of those who have meaningful work. Yeah, and, I, and, you know, and, and some people because really want to glamorize it. I mean, there's a lot of Marxists that just want to continue to valorize labor and not really acknowledge the fact that, that it's just another blockage towards a communist well, and this society. Is, this is part of the story and the mythos of the work ethic is that suffering and remuneration is equated with the amount of suffering that you need yeah, to yeah. work. Well, you, this is actually why there are so many adjunct college teachers in the community college system is because they know it's meaningful for those people. Right. They're willing to like not get health care or middle yeah. class income because they'll have mastery on their curriculum and right. they'll have freedom in the classroom. So there's, it's actually part of the market system in community colleges. Like I said, I, I would say probably about you know, seventy to eighty-five percent of most community colleges are made up of shittily paid part-time workers with no health care, no benefits, no vacation. They routinely go on unemployment every summer, and everyone pretends this is an, an ethical quandary. And they most people take these jobs continuously because of the fact that that job is meaningful, more meaningful right. than a public school. So it becomes priced into that market re- reaction. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's part it's of your com- part of your compensation is often. Oh, this is meaningful work, so, so you, you get exactly. less renew, renew. Yeah, and this is how you know the bourgeois settle their affairs when it talks about their administrative work. Is yeah, it's boring, it's droning on, but I have the official degrees, and therefore you have to pay me well because it's not as desirable, right. even though it's of course not coal mine work. Right, and this is this is the odd the, one of the one of the odd characteristics of the moment we live in that work and the drudgery of work and the sacrifice. Yeah, no, I mean that this is the thing is. The drudgery, the hardship, the lack right. of freedom. Right. People most often times when they're at work, and I know I felt this way when I was working at my first job, like JC Zips or Chuck E. Cheese, you were just consciously trying to escape from that material world through daydreaming. So ludic mm-hmm. dreaming was a huge part of my shitty jobs, was just 
mind wandering into places that didn't involve work. So, and the idea that work is awful is the fact that people complain when their workplace is slow, right? <laughs> because they actually want to kill time to yeah. be free. Yeah, yeah. So they're killing their time and celebrating the killing of their time to get out of work. Right. So they, they, we, the fact that you work a food line at a uh, fast food place and you're celebrating how busy it was, like, oh, I just destroyed my time. Yeah, yeah. And now I can get out and actually experience some level of freedom. Right. You'll, you'll, you'll feel like you're getting closer to 5 o'clock. And I, and I felt that with my first job at J.C. Zips in you know, Kennewick, Washington, or Richland, Washington, depending on how you look at it, depending on the, the county line or city line. But, but when I'm working and just really pumping tartar out and <laughs> making uh-huh. hamburgers and french fries and yeah. cleaning the vats of oil for yeah. people to have a joy ride with, yeah. I kept feeling like, why am I happy that I lost time? That it sped up. Mm-hmm. Well, you're trying to get to Friday. Thank God it's Friday. <laughs> TGIF. TGIF. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and uh, Charles Eisenstein talks about this in Sacred Economies, which we'll probably talk about as a book. It's a great book. But the idea that you know he woke up as a child thinking, why is it that we're sad on Mondays? Well, we, right. This this brings us to the text that we're talking about this week, which is. Inventing the Future, Post-Capitalism in a World Without Work by Nick Cernick and Alex Williams. This is actually one of the chapters in the book is, it's not Mondays you hate, it's work. It's, a, it's work itself. Right. It's not Mondays you hate, it's just work yourself. And do we have Nick's pronunciation It's not Mondays right? you hate, it's your job. Cernick? Cernick, yeah. Cernick, the C is silent? Apo- apologize if it's... But that's how I've heard yeah. it pronounced. So one of them's a Brit, one of them's a Canadian. Mm-hmm. I think. Yes. And they've both gone on to write two books after this. But um, yeah, they wrote. They wrote a book separately. Uh, I think. They wrote, right? Well, they wrote something together previously that was about uh, accelerationism, mm-hmm. which they, for obvious reasons, and the the problematics in the discourse of accelerationism and its appropriation by others. They've they since dropped and and didn't, that didn't work. That language itself didn't work its way into this project, this book. But what's your what's your overall take, Matt, on on this? And when did when did you when did you read it? And what did you think? This about isn't this? a very important book, actually. Our, our friend that's going to come on again, Joshua Bregman, who was on our our wonderful podcast that no one listened to, called uh, what's the title? The German Corbin. <laughs> year post. many they are few. Yeah, yeah. Year many year many they are few. And the, uh, the Percy, Corb- Percy Shelley poem. Exactly. Yeah. And Joshua had mentioned the book to me, and I okay. and I had, I think on Novara Radio I had heard an interview with the authors and was pretty impressed. Yeah, Aaron Bastani did and, uh, and James Butler discussion with both of them. I think I don't know if James yeah. Butler was on there. We'll, too. we'll link. We'll, we'll I have the link, we'll link to that. that. We'll, and we'll then I'll this. link also the secondary interview that happened on the in the in America by Doug Henwood behind the news. That's a great podcast mm-hmm. also. Mm-hmm. And they were interviewed by Doug Henwood, which is interesting because. Aaron Bastani was much more openly supportive of the book and actually said this is like the best book this yeah, year right. that he's read. And yeah. uh, he's a big reader of nonfiction and politics. And Doug Henwood had more of an ambivalent feeling about the book mm. because there's a kind of Marxist aspect with Doug Henwood where he tends to want to think that work is still somewhat meaningful. He will we'll agree that it's often arduous and, and drudgery. But he also was very suspicious about the rate of automation, right, and that right. was suspicious of, about this. Is yeah, and, and Peter Fraze mentions part, Doug yeah. Henwood's suspicion about this as well, right? And kind of his more Marxist nostalgia towards work, right. whereas Bastani's like openly accepting of this idea. Aaron Bastani really liked the fact that they were saying, "Let's get rid of work." Right, and and I think this book opened up the space for Aaron Bastani and the Navarra Media Group to lay claim or coin, I don't know that they coined it, but they've certainly adopted it as part of their rhetoric, the the, the phraseology of fully <laughs> automated luxury communism. Fully automated luxury. Which, of course, we'd take a one step further to the left and, and call, it call, fully, fully, call, call for fully automated luxury anarchism. Yeah, or fully real, automated real, luxury real, anarchy, right? Yeah, so, yeah, real freedom. Real freedom, exactly. Yeah. So by its basis has had some influence within the left, right? But the but what about for left. you? What, so I would Josh say this referred book, it... Yeah, Josh, Josh referred to it to me, and then I heard on Navarro Radio, and I was like, okay, I'm sold, I'm going to read it. And I didn't finish it. I started halfway, and then, of course, I, know, I remember I was, bu- I was bugging you forever, to, uh, for months, oh, to yeah. read well, this. It's, I was it's, like, it's, you got to read this book. you got to read this book. What, as I mentioned earlier, I, I basically assign books that I haven't read 
uh, from my classes courses, very often yeah. for fun. Mm -hmm. And so that was competing with those other books, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've, you've, as well as my activism with the 20 years. You've always got a lot of reading yeah, so to it do. Wasn't, it wasn't exactly like I didn't want to read it or that it was badly written. No. I mean, as a book, it's more on the academic side than Peter Fraser's Four Futures. Right. So if I had to give students a book on the future and capitalism, right. I would definitely give Peter Fraser's book Four Futures first. It's yeah, 150 I'm, I'm, pages. It's actually less than 150 pages if it was actually a full you know, book size page, right. but but it's more poetic, small more breezy. It's a small format book. Yeah. It's more poetic, more breezy, has a real sense of style, and it's obviously someone who wants to entertain you on the sentence level with yes. some creative, artful phrases. This is much more workmanlike. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it's dead inside in terms of ideas. It Not actually has all. richer ideas, I oh, yeah. think, as a book, but it's also longer, too. It's 183 pages with you know 55 pages of footnotes, and so it does have some repetitions. It does have some kind of really flat-footed transitions where it kind of repeats itself too much inside or between chapters. But uh, I would say, generally speaking, this has a richer system of ideas to offer, mm -hmm. and it's the more important book, especially if you're kind of zoned in to these conversations about universal basic income or if you read on automation, then this is a book that's really... Yeah, yeah, certainly for anyone invested in the strategies of you know emancipation uh, and, and the fight for human rights and, and justice, this mm -hmm. is... Mm -hmm. a, and it recognizes, you know, if you will, the Marxist framework and the primacy of class. Uh, and it's, as, not dog, as it's, a, not dogmatic. I mean, no, it's not dogmatic. I mean, I did definitely felt like they both came from more Marxist traditions mm -hmm, absolutely. because they're more fair about... Marxist uh, notions of appropriating the state right. than they were about local forms of mobilization. Right. And so they're kind of uh, dismissiveness, not outright, certainly, and they're more fair-minded towards anarchists, but I definitely got the sense that they're more Marxist slash communist than anything. And I don't need to get into sectarian aspects, but it does flavor the way that they look right. at the models. Right. And so I, I think I should say that I haven't talked to you, Matt, about this directly before, but I think... In reflection, at least, this book is one of the reasons we are even doing this podcast. Mm -hmm. So this book was published in 2015, and I read it about a year and a half ago, so mm -hmm. in early 2016. Mm -hmm. I read it, and I remember I was bugging you for a long time to, to read this book, and we should discuss it. And, and I mentioned Josh had told me about the book. Exactly. And, so, you know. But I think the framework that they dive into here, which will we'll break down a bit um, through this discussion, was a very smart critique of the tactics of mm -hmm. the left in recent history, mm -hmm. uh, since Occupy especially, and the, the failures of that, mm -hmm. but, but put forward propositions in alternative type of strategy or framework mm -hmm. for a strategy. And so there's actually really positive ideas here. Yeah. There's, really a, there's actually a set of demands, mm -hmm. which... Mm -hmm. Um, they, they, they try to make very clear in the book the, about the necessity for making explicit mm -hmm. demands uh, mm -hmm. and also to fit all of that within an understanding and, a, and a, a reading of the current trajectories of automation mm -hmm. and well, the crisis in work this and is one of the crisis books, in capitalism. This is one of the books that was around the time that we started rebroaching the idea of doing a podcast, right? No, this is well before. This is what this, I'm saying. This oh, is well before. So you think this... well. It came up when we were doing the podcast. We talked about one of the... Well, it came up, the no, no, no. I've, yeah, yeah. I've, I've had this as something we've, mm -hmm. I wanted to, to talk about I'm, the whole I'm time, saying it was one of the unconscious drivers towards us starting up a podcast. You think that... that Because we had talked about it casually, you know, about podcasts, but I think this was an unconscious driver towards doing this yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, why isn't there more books like well, this? Well, I, I think what they prescribe in here, too, is in a way exactly what we're attempting to do, right? Which is the whole framework of our, our discussions and the sequencing and um, the art of doing this podcast is to try to accomplish or to be part of accomplishing part of... The Disney version of Imagineering, right? So right, we're doing the, the communist version of Imagineering. Right. So it calls the people's think tank. Right, right, right. So well, there's, that's there's, the idea, is that, the, and there's that a we point, provide this yeah, and there's platform. Yeah, and there's a point in the, the text here that where they, where they make a, an argument for the necessity in any forward-looking, future-looking uh, left movement, uh, broad left movement for utopian thinking, mm -hmm. right? That, mm -hmm. that we have to have a vision of what the future ought to look like. And, and then I think, as well, to tie back to um, its influence and its significance in these, last, these past few years, 
in a greater effort and a greater sort of coalition building of socialist and you know far left and progressive m- movements uh, mm-hmm. recently, both in the Bernie Sanders campaign and mm-hmm. in, in the, the the rise of Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party's successes earlier this year. I think this laid some of the groundwork for a lot of folks. At least, at least mm-hmm. was part of the discourse that allowed for. Yeah, and this this book was published in two thousand fifteen. Yeah. And so I don't know the exact month, but Bernie Sanders announced his campaign in, I think, July of 2015 in the summer. So this book had come out before Occupy had probably had any electoral expression. And that's what you saw with Bernie Sanders' campaign is people basically that were involved with Occupy became deeply enraptured with Bernie Sanders' campaign of taking these demands and concerns of Occupy. And in fairness, many of the demands that Occupy had are things that Sanders had been uh, fighting for verbally yeah, for a long, long time. Long before then. But certainly he benefited from that frustration of wanting to see these ideas well, take mainstream form. <laughs> well, here, here you are sitting here as rec- record wearing a Bernie Sanders is magical shirt. I think, I think, we'll post you, the image you, you know, you, yeah. I'll take a photo and we'll link it. But, but yeah, so, but, you know, I mean, I think you're not a fucking pink unicorn, goddamn it, with purple. <laughs> Purple blue wings. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you're a you're an example here of yeah. this, and, and I think you're um, you know not a common example, but I think uh, your work uh, both in teaching and in outside of the classroom and and doing projects like this is, for me at least, and how how I how I read your activity in relation to these bigger movements mm-hmm. is a clear example of someone who has really been energized one mm-hmm. by the folk politics, and we'll get into this mm-hmm. phraseology mm-hmm. here. The folk politics of Occupy Wall Street, but just as a doorway into greater, you mm-hmm. know, forward thinking mm-hmm. visions of a better world and how to build mm-hmm. solidarity and coalition. Thinking to get strategically, there. right? Yeah, yeah. I absolutely. mean that that was where, you know, Occupy and we'll talk about folk to politics soon, but where there was actually demands with Bernie's campaign and there was a real sense right. of strategy right. of maneuvering through that horribly horribly fucked up system. Right. Of electoral politics and managing to push forward ideas that are now kind of on the on the forehead of the Democratic Party, right? You know, and and I think more than any more than anything else uh, specific uh, outside of the four demands that they they list in the book that are really all related to work mm-hmm. and automation is that the book is a an argument for strategy mm-hmm. basically it is an argument for mm-hmm. having a clear strategy for build like how do you build a strategy the strategy of the book is to say we've got to have we've got to have a strategy <laughs> yeah basically yeah. yeah i think i think of course that makes total sense yeah why can't we talk about what we need to build right right right, right. And, and and well and they, and they they go into that a bit in the well, book like why that's not and it's an honest acknowledgement of of like the limits of what the left has been doing since the 1960s. Right. Uh, so, do you want to go into that introduction? Right. In so, the, I mean, chapter? the basic thesis, the framework of the bur- of the book is that, look, we we've been drowning in failures uh, mm. as the air quotes left, and so they do a little diagnosis of what and, is this failure, and about? they also Why? talk about what we had initially had as a forward impulse, a Star mm-hmm. Trek impulse. So, mm-hmm. you know, the introduction's got these two great points. I'll read. Where did the future go? For much of the 20th century, the future held sway over our dreams. On the horizons of the political left, a vast assortment of emancipatory visions gathered, often springing from the conjunction of popular political power and the liberating potential of technology. From the predictions of new worlds of leisure, to Soviet-era cosmic communism, to Afro-futurist celebrations of the synthetic and diasporic nature of black culture, to post-gender dreams of radical feminism, the popular imagination of the left envisioned societies vastly superior to anything we dream of today. And then they go back to this. Yet for all of the glossy sheen of our technological era, we remain bound by an old, obsolete set of social relations. We continue to work long hours, commuting further to perform tasks that feel increasingly meaningless. Our jobs have become more insecure. Our pay has stagnated and our debt has become overwhelming. We struggle to make ends meet, to put food on the table, to pay rent or the mortgage, And as we shuffle from job to job, we reminisce about the pensions and struggle to find affordable child care. Automation renders us unemployed and stagnant wages devastate the middle class, while the corporate profits surge to new heights. The glimmers of a better future are trampled and forgotten under the pressures of an increasingly precarious and demanding world. And each and every day, we return to work as normal, exhausted, anxious, stressed, and frustrated. 
This book is about how we got here and where we might go next. You, right. So this is like you know this is actually the most poetic part of the book is that introduction, <laughs> right, and you can hear there's a real yeah. emotional pull in this, yeah. which I wish there was a little bit more of uh, as exactly as a book. But this seems like a book that's aimed towards people that are already really cognizant and don't need to be emotionally pulled into this direction. Right. That right, just right. want to really right. go into the nitty gritty. I mean, it is a policy book mm-hmm. in some sense. Yeah, yeah. A strategy about why the left needs a strategy, mm-hmm. and then to map out some of those demands. Yeah, and the the basic framework of, of this is that we had the classical demands of the left for you know the union demands for mm-hmm. shorter work hours and shorter work week, end of scarcity and mm-hmm. um, the social welfare state uh, for more economic democracy and for liberation for all have faltered. You know, since the late '60s, and is by no mistake, and they go into a little, they, they break down uh, when talking about neoliberalism. Um, you can glean why this uh, is the case, but that those things, those demands, the classic demands of the left, mm-hmm. are more achievable now than ever. Mm-hmm. Right? We're, they're closer. We're 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 so close, but yet so far away. Mm-hmm. Right? They're right around the corner. If only we could have a strategy, mm-hmm. and if we could mobilize, and if we could somehow do the reverse of what neoliberalism mm-hmm. has done over the last mm-hmm. 40 years. Yeah, borrow from their mixtape. Right, 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 right. And look at what they mixed and remixed to put in their mixtape for a kind of future that was great for the 1%. And once again, the long-term view. So von Hayek and the Mont Pelerin Institute, or the, the, the think tank, and then as well James Buchanan, who was playing the long game mm-hmm. day one, mm-hmm. they knew that to have the real paradigm shift you have to be be playing a long term game, right. and that's where it goes into the first chapter of uh, introducing the term folk politics, because folk politics is the exact opposite of playing the long game. It's right. a fetishization of immediacy yeah. and mm-hmm. emotional feeling. Yeah. So it puts a primacy on emotional feelings, and I, I they don't give a start date, but to me, I would say 1968, the Situationists would be the beginning of this kind of Well, this is this thing. is the thing about, so this is the, and we were discussing beforehand, this is probably the most unique and useful phrase uh, mm-hmm. that they coin in, in the text is folk politics. Which they talk about with it's folk very, psychology and yeah, those sorts it, of things. It's a, it's a very apt term mm-hmm. to capture what they're trying to describe, which is not any concrete or specific capturable movement or mm-hmm. set of, Things, historical set of things that happened, but r- rather a characteristic of the more recent activities of those on the left. And, and it plays to me is, with it plays to me with the connotations of folk music, yeah, right, which is about that stripped down emotional connection with you and the listener, mm-hmm. where all of this excess has been stripped away, this complexity. So fuck Stereo Lab, fuck Radiohead. <laughs> let's listen to Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan and Vashti and, and you know. Let's listen to folk music. And so right. there is an element of that which I pulled off, which is this idea of like community and gathering and immediacy. Now, they don't go and say that these are bad things. No. But if we're treating them as essentialist strategies, more, it, they're not strategies. Yeah, I think, it's, it's, I think it's more a calling out of what is the key characteristic of the, the last 30 years of the key movements and activities for emancipatory movements in the past 30, 40 years that has been. A shortcoming, yeah, right, and the shortcoming that they coin folk politics is specifically this infatuation with the immediate, with the local, with fetishizing horizontalism, fetishizing and horizontalism. direct action, yeah. mm-hmm. right. And so these are anarchist elements, but they also go back to the Quakers, they go back to the the anti war movement, but especially uh, black liberation struggles and the women's movement. And we can talk about uh, Friedman's essay called uh, "Tyranny of Structuralistness." And that's an essay that right. they don't talk about, but no. implicates the fact that uh, know, hierarchy does. No, they don't mention it at all. Okay. I, that, that's that. I, you know, I just actually reread the folk politics section because that's the part that got me the most upset. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? And, and I could talk, a, talk, an attack, maybe on. Yeah, but it's also like an attack on anarchy too. So I mean, it's it's really weird. Yeah, chapter. but I think I think they're very they're very careful to not place it as an attack squarely on horizontalism yeah. or on anarchy and. And in all of their discussions, you know, after the publishing of the book and all the interviews and podcasts and, and the likes that they're on, they make a point of that as well. And and I got that clearly from the book. I didn't see it as a as being an attack on the the tactics of the left, more a 
an analysis of mm. the characteristics of the failures of those it's, movements. It's a power analysis, it's like, power like analysis, of, yes. the lack of power right. in the left and how right. that, that they've been able to accomplish limited wins. And they do talk about direct action being specific in terms of putting borders on, on privatization. So you know the direct action of, of covering over concrete with spikes on it to that to, that would prevent the homeless from actually sleeping on the ground and right. benches and those sorts of things. They they don't discard those, but those are kind of trying to ameliorate capitalism and neoliberalism rather than actually create a counter hegemony, which we'll talk about later. Right, and and the and the idea is that the folk politics and the way that it's played out in occupations like Occupy, the whole Occupy movement. Indignado's movement and um, Arab Spring to some extent. And right. More, of course, more increasingly more, they talk about the Argentinian crisis. Yeah, but uh, mostly this, this critique is most clear in the Occupy movement where this folk politics and the infatuation with immediacy mm-hmm. is really, in a way, that there's a good component of it, which mm-hmm. is, um, this is a sort of double-edged thing that this to occupy the square and to try to practice this horizontalism is a way to prefigure what mm-hmm. the, the future might be. Yeah, right? prefigurative the, politics. Pre-figurative that, that's something politics. David Graeber talked about when he was one of the you know, institutional members of, of the first G General Assembly, when they broke off of a standard hierarchical union-type protest right. that then just broke off into a direct assembly, General Assembly, that followed very... I would say some ways doctrinaire kind of aspects of organizing, so in, in anarchist circles, so re- rotating facilitator, call signs, the notion or fetishization that they call it, fetishization of consensus, mm-hmm. that became an element of right. the, the kind of logic there, right. is that, you know, that this fetishization of anarchist principles right, mm-hmm. is ultimately not a, a counter-hegemony. It's mm-hmm. not something that's going to contest the paradigm above, and they talk about the fact that the encampments were certainly broken up by police brutality, by police action, by the actions of the state, but they said that there was still going to be, a, and, and there was an increasing structural crisis, which is that this kind of uh, obsession with horizontalism meant that there was no mediation, right? right? And there, that mediation is an important part of social organizing, and there isn't an element of social mediation. And the things that did happen, that did have force, were things that had, were done from a kind of council network mm-hmm. that was much smaller, mm-hmm. lighter on its feet, and could make decisions much better. Mm-hmm. And the the kind of worship of consensus, and I, you know, of course, I, I'm coming from the perspective of someone who was actually involved in Occupy. I get no sense that they were involved in Occupy whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, they're looking from yeah. outside, and that's why I got frustrated by some of the misconceptions about Occupy, at least from um, organizing Occupy it, Riverside, I mean, was that. There was a real profound shaping of the experience of feeling like you're part of a democratic process because you certainly aren't at work and, and you certainly aren't when you vote. And right. so that was a profound and, experience for people. And, and I don't think they missed that. I think what they may have missed is the on the ground, you know, in person experience to the extent that you had with it mm-hmm. to give a personal reflection, like a personalized or well, m- more um, my, my feelings is My feelings is they it. kind of say, okay, this has limits. It's nice. It does some nice things, but we got to move on. It doesn't say like we can bring this back into. I, I don't know. I, they, I, they say we, no, no, no. They absolutely say that folk politics is necessary. Part it's in the of, toolbox. It's in, well, no, that it's, it is a starting point. Mm-hmm. Right, so folk politics isn't something mm-hmm. that is mm-hmm. to be cast aside. It's it's just like you know, I got to have a, a reading of what it is, what its hallmarks are, and recognize that it's one step. It's only a first step. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just briefly reference the end chapters, which doesn't bring that back in. Right, I mean, it doesn't bring back. I, folk I suppose politics maybe they, like, they do all this. It in doesn't the reimagine folk chapter. politics within the continuity of. Their demands for counter hegemony. So that's my well, this my is, problem with the book is that it says okay, it's got limits, it's good, it's it's time has come, but it doesn't bring it back. So, again. so this is maybe a problem for you, but I think one of the reasons this is a significant text for me is that it left these a, a lot of things actually throughout. I mean, this is one of them, but a, m- most of the assertions and the and even the list of demands that are uh, configured here leave open all the space of details, necessarily so mm-hmm. in a less than 200 page text. Yeah. But, but I think this is unique, uniquely functions, at least the way that I've read it and I've um, responded to it in a way that you, you hear almost every graduate student want to 
uh, have their work affect the world, which is to start conversations. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I think a, as a model of a, a sort of book that, a sort of text that I just, can lead to opening up, starting conversations. I just conversations. thought it was... Maybe it just you're, you're maybe a little too much academic. Crit- no, I just thought critique. it was a little bit anarchophobic. That's all I could say. Is it tended to I ritualize? Mean, can, you, can you blame if you're trying to have a broad appeal? Well, text? no, not really, because the people that they're that are attuned to radical politics are increasingly coming from the Occupy experiences, Black Lives Matters, which are also horizontal movements, by the way. Right, right, right. And that you have to say, okay, not that it's got its limits, and let's move on, but actually. Imagine when it talks about the common cause ch- chapter, common sense chapter, and mm-hmm. building power. Mm-hmm. It has to find a way of bringing those back in to make those added elements towards counter hegemony. And I think that I'll get back to that later. But I said that's why I said it's kind of anarchophobic. And then once again, I do totally agree with their assessment of the failures of Occupy when it came to no demands. Mm-hmm. You are not making a fucking radical mm-hmm. move when you have no fucking demands. Right. You can't come up with them. And this fetishization of not having mediation or demands mm-hmm. ultimately means that you're kind of reactionary. I mean, right. it's not actually, it's not a radical kind of pulse of revolutionary movement well, and, if you don't have a strategy. And, and ultimately isn't going to lead in and of itself to bringing about change. Or right? building power networks. It, so I think the where they fall short in recognizing to the extent that it has been significant uh, and you, your experience is probably being again one clear example of this is that the practice of horizontalism in the square, mm-hmm. the the sort of politics as pastime mm-hmm. and, and other sort of things like anti-war protests and and all the things that get yeah. easily consumed in the neoliberal ideology um, or subsumed by, I should say, perhaps. Are doorways for folks, yeah. right? Are, and, are red carpets for folks to and, feel and folk to politics get involved. doesn't mean that you have no demands. It's just in the case of Occupy, it didn't really have right, any. Right. I mean, the Argentinian crisis and the occupation of the, the factories is an example of not just tactic but strategy. But also, my group, the Twenty Eighters, still follows uh, horizontalism. Mm-hmm. We have rotating right. facilitator. Yeah. We don't require complete consensus on everything. We feel like we've exhausted our ability to reach consensus. Mm-hmm. We vote by what we call supermajority, mm-hmm. right? And we let everybody hear each other out, and we move on. And that's a, been a really great adaptation from Occupy. And of course, many of the co-founding members were from Occupy, so we adapted those horizontal things. But hey, we have an actual goal. It's tenable. It's real. So when you can institute horizontalism, it's a good thing, and it's R- something that we want to have involved. And I don't. Right. Once again. I, I don't think they want to get rid of it. I just felt like it needed to be brought back into the toolbox towards the last couple chapters. Yeah, and I, and I don't, I don't think we we want to harp on the the paragraphs about horizontalism too much yeah, and, yeah. and over overstate that because it's not that's not the point of all of it. I think the point of the uh, the notion of folk politics is if the effort is not one that has deep systems yeah, and strategic analysis, yeah. analysis towards it with at least some uh, specified demands mm-hmm. and a vision, and how how those specified demands are part of a vision for the mm-hmm. future and what mm-hmm. the what the world ought to look like. Then, then they're bound to yeah. be subsumed a- by. As a metaphor, it's like band aids to the state. It's mm-hmm. not imagining a new state. Right. It's not imagining statelessness. It's trying to ameliorate the worst aspects of capitalism. So they talk about rolling jubilee, mm-hmm. which David Graeber was supportive of and came out of Occupy Wall Street. But once again, you know, buying up debt within the current system is not actually reversing the system. Mm-hmm. And so rolling jubilee, which was the idea of buying up student debt or debt itself and 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 basically uh, getting rid of it completely right. for people, that's not a way to scale up. You can't right. scale that up. Right, right, right. And so those are, those are great elements. So like I, I said, I. I genuinely love the term folk politics because yes. yeah. I can meet a fair number of anarchists or people that are anti-authoritarian that really worship and fetishize uh, immediacy and micro-localism. But right. if it doesn't build toward anything and it's not scalable in terms of creating power networks, right. and I think that one of the best critiques in that first chapter is that in the Arab Spring for Egypt, they actually didn't have general assemblies and they worked with unions and they worked with other right. organizations. Right. And Occupy never made outreach to yeah. those organizations in any meaningful way because they were contaminated by hierarchy. Right. right. So we can't touch them. Right. And the only element we had the unions involved with in Riverside was 
SEIU gave us their space, their parking lot to have an encampment, which wasn't really cool because it wasn't in the downtown per se. And also it just ended up being um, needle users and people that just totally whacked out um, and, and people didn't feel safe there. And so that didn't end up becoming a worthwhile kind of arrangement. But right. it did talk about the fact that Occupy was so insular that it wasn't able to build anything because it was so obsessed with its own horizontalism. The folk politics notion is the crux of their, mm -hmm. uh, and the overarching and framework for their critique of uh, the left and the, their assessment of why the left is, has been losing for 40 years. And it's a correct assessment. Yeah. There's no doubt about um, yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the other part of this, though, this not, doesn't fall necessarily, I mean, it's part, partially part of this folk politics thing, but it's a whole problem unto itself, I think, is this notion that resistance is futile, that, mm -hmm. uh, again, to bring up the, the common adage that it's easier to Im imagine the, the end of the world than the mm -hmm. end of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And um, Frederick Jameson. Yeah, and I mean, I hear this every day. Oh, yeah. Almost everyone I talk well, to. Every, so almost every, I have to say, almost every conversation I get into with folks who... Are they white people? No. Oh, just no, everybody? No, no. Is that UCLA or just... Yeah, everyone? I mean, as, you yeah, know, especially, in especially in the workplace. I mean, folks who may or may not have listened to the, an episode or more of the podcast and are comrades in solidarity mm. with mm. you know, building a better future at least theoretically, but are not actively or politically mm -hmm. engaged to the extent that you well, are, well, right, he, are constantly using this refrain. Like, well, well what the fuck are we supposed the, to that's do? That's the whole point of this podcast is like, if we actually do create an imagined future that involves a new form of an economic system, mm -hmm. then you can't excuse yourself out from committing to that process. Right. So because of the failure of imagination, and that's a core element of their conversation points, is that the, this resistance is futile, that we can't make large-scale collective social change, so we retreat back to this kind of folk politics. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting that it did mention in Chapter 1, just a brief mention of that, it talks about conspiracy theories mm -hmm. and Frederick Jameson's notion, notions that they arise out of people's desire to have a clean narrative mm -hmm. for why things are fucked up. Mm -hmm. And folk politics is a, a, a kind of the left version of conspiracy theories, although I, I would say conspiracy theories run in all the gamuts of the political reality. But it is a retreat right. from the the demanding hard work of imagining the future. And it's not right. just oh, yeah. activists or general public. This is a debate in science fiction. So we talked about the episode on um, The Circle, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think that was episode four. Yeah, um, We talked about TDS, terminal dystopia syndrome. That is his problem too in science fiction communities. Dude, this, this is the deluged by uh, dystopian thinking. This is, the hall, this is the hallmark of the mm -hmm. cultural, a cultural moment or cultural era, I should say, mm -hmm. that sees resistance as mm -hmm. futile. It sees no other path outside of the, the, the dominant hegemonic ideology is this terminal dystopia syndrome. So they try to work away from nostalgia, resistance, uh, withdrawal. A folk politics is something that's simply the immediate moment mm -hmm. and imagine something that's sculpted out of a bigger movement. Right, right. right. So, the, so the argument here, the flow of the argument here then says, okay, this is, these are the reasons, some of the reasons that the left is losing, why emancipatory projects aren't going anywhere because... There is a there is a dominant mm -hmm. all ideology. There is a common sense that pervades the in, world that we live in. In now. Murray Bookchin, we could call this lifestyleism, right? This idea that we'll just opt out individually. And this folk politics is strangely individualistic in a sense because you <laughs> right. opt out from what you don't like. Right. I think I think the most poetic quote that they had they use in there is the uh, Jody from, Dean. from Jody Dean, uh, author Jody Dean. Uh, Goldman Sachs doesn't care if you raise chickens. <laughs> I don't fucking give a shit. Well, yeah, it's just that and you live in live go fucking live in yeah, Mount Washington the, and have your backyard. You're going to be a fringe and, element that's not building power, yeah. so you're not going to threat them. So they and they no, cite no Zapatistas as an example of how you could have an anarchist commune or whatever, but you're not actually threatening the source of power, right? And you're not building power to threaten them. So I think the idea is, of course, that yes, localism has benefits, horizontalism has benefits, mm -hmm. folk politics has benefits, but it's not an overarching kind of vision. No, but in contrast to that, the current and for the duration of our lifetimes, basically the, the dominant ideology has been that of neoliberalism. Which, and, and electoral politics, what they cite, is, is, is more empty and more right. meaningless 
right. and folk politics. They by, by no means saying that, hey, the duopoly of the political party system is better than folk politics. Mm-hmm. They say folk politics comes from a desire to have an authentic democratic experience. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the main point. They don't even bother talking that much in these first two chapters about electoral politics because it's obvious yeah. to everyone that it's garbage. Yeah. So they're talking about within, it's like a left internal critique about what's wrong with us, mm-hmm. right? And so when it moves, oh, to, absolutely. This when is it talking moves to chapter three, it's like, okay, now that we know what's wrong with us, if you agree with us, what did the right do that's to, a, to win? That, that's, a, that's a good point, I think, that this is talking to the left, but it is not preaching to the choir. Yes. And I think that's part of what drew me so much to, mm-hmm. um, to this, whole t- this text altogether, was that it's giving new... Ideas. Well, it's offering up new ideas to the choir. It's like a friend, and I've quoted this before, is that when ideology blocks human flourishing, it's not human flourishing that needs to get blocked out. It's the ideology. Mm-hmm. And so if the left is unwilling to critique its own ideologies, it's, it's kind of praxis, right? right? As Marshall Gaughan said about Occupy, what they're saying here is also true. What Marshall Gaughan said is that Occupy... Uh, mistook a strategy for a tactic, mm-hmm. right? The, it, it, the occupying is a tactic; it's not a long-term strategy. And so, you building off that, they Mis- say, "Okay, mis- where do we come a up?" Tactic for a strategy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, going from that, the third chapter is about, well, why do they win? We yes. talked about she was like there was slingshot, <laughs> slingshot seven. We talked about our last episode is like, well, why do they win and what do they do right? Right. And this chapter is like, what do they do right? Yeah, yeah. What did neoliberals do right? that changed in the next 40 years of history. Well, and, and I would caution against um, framing it as doing right. Instead, right in terms of winning. Instead, yeah. about how did it take hold, mm-hmm. right? So how did the right, how did the radical ideas of uh, oh, open yeah, market you, you capitalism... Know, you know what I mean, right, in terms of their no, no, their ability no, no, no. to win. No, 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 right? I'm just yeah. being a little more surgical with yeah. the language there. But But so what were the things that were in the toolbox for... The neoliberal right, so they lay, lay out a little, little history of neoliberalism and why that's an important thing to look at in the first place, and why that is mm-hmm. the the most probably the most important thing to look at, given that it defines the horizons of what is even imaginable in our. our they use this phrase that I love that I've heard, but I have to do more research. Called the Overton window. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know where that's from? I I should have checked the footnotes. I, yeah, but they talk about that in a later but, chapter called the Overton Window. Yes. And neoliberalism sculpted out a the new Overton, Overton window. window. Yeah. Their their logic and arguments were kind of laughed at by Keynesian and Keynesianism, which was the dominant ideology of economics at the time. Which which, al- and right. Keyne- Keynesianism. which which allowed for uh, the notion of the, there are some things outside of the market. Yes. <laughs> right. And that the state has to intervene in those spaces that all outside of and that naturally economic and that the Great Depression was a result of a lack of oversight, right. right, and a lack of regulation, and that was a common sense idea of it. And of course, Milton Friedman took a very different reading of it the, of the of the Great Depression, mm-hmm. uh, which is that there was too much regulation, right? Uh, which you know this is fucking insane, um, <laughs> but you know once again he's he's a, he's kind of a quack artist in some sense because he has to acknowledge. At some point, he never does, that capitalism is a deceitful, distrustful institution where people are trying to rip each other off. So you kind of want to regulate shit where people are ripping each other off. Yeah, or can rip each other yeah, off. Yeah, this is... This is a, this it's like, is, hey, we're going to play basketball with no fucking you know, uh, referees. I, I think, and somehow it'll work out really well. Yeah, Would anybody watch basketball <laughs> if there were no fucking referees? <laughs> I don't think so. And so Milton Friedman's idea is like, oh yeah, there just was too much regulation even then. <laughs> <laughs> but, but well, no, no, I mean, their, our, their overall the overall project is to like actually let's control the referees too. Let's <laughs> no, no. The referees are obviously obviously the referees are a, a synthetic part of this. They they're part of the construction of mm-hmm. the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we can't just have them operate objectively yeah. independently. Like there's well, some the, sense of fairness. They got it. We have to control Fr- the whole. Friedman fucking, would say that the the referee would be just the judicial branch, right? That the state has no involvement. They would eliminate the state's ability and power in that. And so uh, the organization. Let me get this right. The Mont Pelerin Society. Yes. Right. Is the kind of like the fucking Death Star <laughs> of neoliberalism. <laughs> right. I mean, it really is the Council of, of the, the Dark the, Jedi's. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and and what do we learn about uh, how they Lords. won? <laughs> well, that basically they played the long game. Mm-hmm. 
they <laughs> they worked long before they, they worked for decades mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right they worked since the 40s 50s mm-hmm. in a penetration from a distance <laughs> oh. they, they were just in aiming. in multifarious ways mm-hmm. right to in in all kinds of ways mm-hmm. in order to seed mm-hmm. uh to plant mm-hmm. the fence of mm-hmm. what could be common sense they were the peeping toms of Keynesianism. So they kind of brought up their little binoculars, got closer and closer, looked for areas of weakness to mm-hmm. go into the house of Keynesianism. Mm-hmm. And so they waited for those loose elements to fall apart mm-hmm. and then had something to just replace it. Right, right. They had a commitment to the long-run war of position in the battle of ideas. So they, they understood mm-hmm. that the future of the world, the design of the world is about the battle of ideas. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are the material objects of the state and of the market and of the capitalist structure, Mm -hmm. but that's what we do with those, how Mm -hmm. those evolve, how those mutate, how they meet the demands of people, either broadly or narrowly, Mm -hmm. is a matter of the collective understanding of what is common sense, well, what's in the debate, and, and it's about ideas. And to replace the expert culture, right? right? I mean, there obviously was fully endowed chair positions, professors that were diehard Keynesianism, which was considered the reality mm-hmm. of a just society, and slowly pick apart that thing by coming up with other funding mechanism, starting to create a culture where they could grow. And many, what's interesting about this too is the the Mont Pelerin Society kept a lot of its disagreements private, right? yes, yeah. which is what the left doesn't do. Right, right. Like, we are just fucking throwing shit at each other on Facebook all the time. Yeah, they had debates behind closed doors. Right. And worked, so, it, worked all this. So they, so they could present a united front. Right. Has the left and, ever had a united front moment other than and, Bernie Sanders? And, I don't think so. Well, and it's not that they necessarily had a united front, but they... Was, they presented. I they said present, presented. Presented, a, right. No, I said presented, motherfucker. <laughs> presented a united <laughs> no, front. I, 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 obviously, I heard, they no, had dis, disharmony. Look, 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 I heard you... And it's not that there's not that all together from all strata, yeah. strata oh, of yeah. of the culture that the impact of neoliberalism was itself presenting a united front. It's that really was strategic, right? Mm-hmm. It was like where is power, mm-hmm. and we need to go where power is and influence mm-hmm. the ideas that mm-hmm. power holds. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it would, the the strategic thing was to have as a central goal mm-hmm. changing the opinion of the elites, of leaders, of those in power who controlled policy mm-hmm. decisions. Mm-hmm. To take our friend Darth Vader and to make <laughs> him even more evil, right? Right. And so, you know, the... I mean, with, and, and, you know, with the overall aim of taking control of the state. Yeah. Right? Of reconfiguring the state, reconfiguring policy and rules deregulation so as to have power over the way the world works. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think that's that's the smart thing is like, has the left in the last 35 years ever played a long game? No. 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 It's all I mean, been it's all been accidental triggers. So not, not in not in any strategic it's all been accidental way. it's all been accidental triggers of frustration and exhaustion. It hasn't right, been right. like, hey let's get together and imagine a new future. It's because once again this Massive civil war between reformists and revolutionaries mm-hmm. has been key oh, to fuck. our, you know, I yeah. have to use the word emasculation, right? Yeah. Like that our, our inability to actually get just results comes from the fact that the revolutionary and reformist components within the Democratic Party, mm-hmm. outside political parties, mm-hmm. is that we can't form a consensus, no. right? And we can't, we can't acknowledge the benefits of both of those aims, uh, when our collective and shared identities have been atomized, there's no longer a popular big tent that captures most of our con- individual conceptions mm-hmm. of our identity, like the working class, right? When you know neoliberalism has virtually erased mm. unions, and there's no longer class solidarity. We mm-hmm. talk about too a little bit later how class solidarity, negative solidarity. That was right. a new term for me. I hadn't run into that. But the idea that if the working conditions of wage slaves at factories got worse, 
then they would get upset about people within the state apparatus that had those benefits. Mm -hmm. And this is actually something even a fellow union organizer mentioned to me, which is we have to change our retirement portfolio and the contributions because most people don't even have a retirement that stays the same. It's just a 401k that floats around and pretends to give you something back. (laughs) And the 401ks have been a disaster. Even the person who invented them said, oh, this is a fuck job. This is supposed to be a supplement, not the replacement of a kind of you know, retirement. Mm -hmm. And so the negative solidarity, it was a way to create a divide and conquer mechanism, Mm -hmm. much like Bacon's Rebellion. We'll just have the whites fight within the whites over what's left. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Bacon's Rebellion was, of course, about the indentured servants and black slaves uniting against the land-bearing class. Negative solidarity is a divide and conquer mechanism. So if wages were being reduced, access to employment was being reduced, pressures on work hours were being um, put on, then that could be used as a tool to create grievances against people that are your brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. And they use that quite well. And beyond that, they also have these secondhand dealers, these think tanks and the op-eds. The, these right. They, I mean, they had basically, you had, taught, you had mentioned this uh, previously, I think it was in the last discussion, about, oh, the left should have a West Point. You know, yeah. West Point for the left. And this is <laughs> more or less what they had yeah. built was this series of think tanks you know these collections of think tanks and uh, intellectuals oh, who yeah. would write and publish op eds. And what does the left have for think tanks? But like Clintonianism, right? I mean, just you know, backwashed progressive neoliberal think tanks. So there is no, no existing there's none, think tank. There's none. We'll we'll, we'll talk about but, one brand new one that may be a glimmer of, of hope <laughs> in that space. You found out about that on Twitter. And, and, we'll and get the, to that. Well, I think. yeah, yeah. But this was the, and this was the objective too, or the long-term objective. Decades of effort. Decades of effort to indoctrinate, if you will, the Mm up-and-coming political class. And they knew, as well as Keynesians knew, that there was going to be a crisis that this wouldn't keep going. Right. So they they built a toolkit and and lay in wait until there was a crisis, like a a (laughs) mousetrap. Yeah, Yeah, mousetrap. Built a (laughs) fucking mousetrap of grenade launchers. Exactly. Get hit in the head in the fucking asshole at the (laughs) same time. Yeah. And this is the thing: is even Keynesianists knew they were running into problems because Keynesianism was able to rely on two things: you could take capital accumulation and and move it into the industrialization of war profiteering. Mm -hmm. So. All that excess profit could go into building up a kind of war economy, selling weapons. So if the U.S. economy wasn't just about making toasters, it was also like selling huge amounts of missiles and weapons to other countries. So that crisis of uh, capital accumulation was able to move into the production of warfare. Mm -hmm. So while we were the only person you could buy shit from, we were also giving lots of weapons to other quote-unquote peaceful states. Mm -hmm. So we, we were able to keep Keynesianism going. And that couldn't last forever, right? And, and it didn't. So when in the seventies, stagflation, we, we found ourselves in this, this condition of stagflation with high unemployment and high inflation at the same time. These were things that the Keynesian model and the couldn't, oil crisis, and the, and oil, the oil crisis, crisis yeah. right? Uh, these were the things that the Keynesian uh, economics, as it was formulated or thought of then, didn't couldn't really deal with, mm-hmm. right? Um, or didn't have a clear path towards curtailing. And as a as a corollary, you're seeing this. You're seeing this in the pink tide in the global south, where the overarching absorption of commodities has popped. So the oil in Venezuela isn't worth anything, and they weren't prepared to deal with this. Now you're going to have a right wing authoritarian reaction to uh, the pink tide because. Once again, there was no preparation for the long game, right. and so. But but the Montpelier and society and this group of neoliberals who had been doing these, you know, prepping people in these things, you know, getting Thatcher and Reagan ready, massaging new power, massaging new power, had both a diagnosis of the problem and a solution, and so this was this window of opportunity for this mm-hmm. to like, okay, now we can let deploy the toolkit, and uh, you know, it's the basis of the beginning of. Uh, Adam Curtis's uh, hypernormalization, exactly, right? Where yeah. the privatization of the New York City uh, was over the fact that they couldn't just pay off things and the yeah, banks yeah. owned all the debt. Yeah, yeah. And so they had no choice but to follow these kind of corporate overlords yeah. uh, into a kind of massive privatization. Let's so, own the air. Exactly. Own Sell it that all. shit. Exactly. Own it all. New markets that haven't been created. Yeah. <laughs> markets we don't even think of as markets. I mean, uh-huh. the invention of markets that didn't even exist. And so then they talk, they talk about how the ideology over the decades, the neoliberal ideology propagated, and the lessons to learn there as well about the division of, of labor, that it wasn't mm-hmm. 
I mean, it's hierarchical and there's behind closed doors, Mm -hmm. Montpelier and society and so forth, but that the propagation was through different fields. So Mm -hmm. in academics and the Chicago school. The heterodox aspects of economic departments just dissipated. Yeah. And with endowments and these sorts of things, and we can go back into the Koch brothers as well as their long game, George Mason University, also just the pummeling of people that were heterodox economists um, that were slowly moved out, and Marxists were slowly moved out of economics departments, mm-hmm. and the only oh, worldview yeah. was a neoliberal and neoclassical right. version right. of economics. Right. That was now considered the only thing you could teach, and because the journals started to form around the idea that this is, you had to use uh, quantitative analysis, not qualitative, quantitative. You couldn't right. ask sociological questions. It all had to be on a fucking graph. <laughs> Fuck. It all had to be on a graph. It's, it had to be on a graph, had to yeah. be an equation, yeah. and we took over the journals, we took over the the professorships, yeah. we created new endowments. And so it's like what Margaret Thatcher said, I think it was in 79, she said, Tina, there is no alternative. Right. Tina Tina is the phrase that right. people often associate with the dawn of, mm-hmm. of neoliberalism. Yeah, is exactly. That just give up. Well, actually, just you know, Tina came out after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89. So actually, I think there is no but part alternative. Of, but part of this yeah. overall story. Yeah, is Tina. You know, so there's academics... Clamping down on the ed- educational realm, there think are tanks that think tanks that are infiltrating policymakers and campaign politicians. Campaign funds, campaign funds, which they don't mention. Sort of uh, yeah, they don't. Is, to, is 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 uh, is the fact that they're able to just pick political cush bags that would basically do their bidding mm-hmm. based on campaign funding. So once again, not mentioned at all, and we'll talk about that later. Just the the gap in the conversation about money and politics, but but definitely. Yeah, they built small, started small, mm-hmm. got bigger and bigger and bigger. With a vision for the world. And went fucking hypersonic uh, after and stagflation. And long-term, long-term plan, laid in wait for opportunities, and thought of it globally. Yeah. Right? It wasn't, it was pretty much the, the opposite, or the antithesis, uh, perhaps, of this folk politics notion. And so chapter four is about left modernity. Mm-hmm. Right? So. After taking a look at uh, the failures of the left and why they're why left is losers, why the neoliberals are winners, what do we um, do? And what, what do, do we do? do? Right. And so, the first thing they tackle here is the idea of the future, yes. basically. Right. And what does modernity mean? Right. Because you know when you we think of it now within the framework of the cage of the ne- neoliberal notion of notions of common sense, when we talk about in the discourse modernizing the workplace the robots are going to take our jobs and oh like that's going to be and it's also during the rage of a kind of identity politics so the right and libertarian thinking started to apply these poetic beliefs in universalism while the left started to form around particularisms yes and constantly reminding me of how different i was from someone else right and that i had to mark my privilege right and so we started to create these barriers between human connection mm-hmm. where neoliberalism offered this you know modus operandi of of the American dream and working hard and the work ethic and that we all have this universal desire to work hard and, and we have to make a choice whether we do that and the idea of you know common humanity. So I started using some of the poetics of humanism right. within this oh, yeah. neoliberal doctrine, which yeah. is incredibly, incredibly clever, right? Because right. It, it's designed to ramp up individual greed and profit-taking by using these universal attributes mm-hmm. of humanism. Right, and have monopolized the whole imagination, oh, collective imagination yes, of yes, the future. without a doubt. And this is very convincing in the book, I think. I mean, yeah. that's particularly smart that they noticed that the individualization of the left versus the kind of the big tent, big belief that we're all in this together. And, you know, the phrase, you know, that capitalism lifts all boats. Of course, what it's not going to acknowledge is that you're fucking under a giant 200-foot wave, so you're going to be lifted temporarily before fucking the other Crashing. boat crashes on top of you. Exactly. But, but yeah, the, the idea that it lifts all boats, that we're all growing together, right. unequally, of course, and right. increasingly more unequal, right. but we're all growing together. So it had this appeal of kind of a bandwagon effect. Of course, a lie. I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, of course, I mean, brilliant is, fucking marketing. Yeah, 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 it's just marketing. Brilliant marketing. And that's what they're good at. I mean, that's the idea. So right. So the ar- argument is like, what you, you know, if we want to engage in the battle for ourselves, for our shared humanity, for a better future, we got to start to uh, mm-hmm. define, reclaim mm-hmm. the modern, re- reclaim the future. Mm-hmm. We have to remember that there's a future, and if we have 
good ideas for that future. We lay out good ideas for that future. Maybe that'll help us get there. And that's like this great line from Broken Social Scene's album, Hug of Thunder, where the Feist sings the following lyric that uh, the future is not what it used to be, but we still got to get there. Right. And, and so this is the chapter where, yes, the future is not what it used to be, what we thought it would be from the communist area, from the black liberation struggles. Right. It's obviously been diminished, right. but we got to get there. The I mean, future's coming regardless. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, the spent, there's the time spent here on the, again, to re- return to this notion of universalism mm-hmm. and uh, universals. Mm-hmm. And I think a really good argument for not... Giving up on that. Not giving up on that, not having a phobia about mm-hmm. universals that actually universals as an ideas, yeah. right, actually might be used in a sub- subversive way oh, yeah. because they can be strategically liberating, oh. uh, set, set a like magnet and for... And marking how these economic regimes of austerity break the view of us universalism, right? right. That, they're, that they're making us apart from each other, right? right. You've seen cartoon images of these, these kind of uh, ghettos with a wall and then these beautiful swimming pools. Yeah. We have to mark that as a denial of the desire for universal connection. Yeah. And Corey Ro- Robin, the thinker and academic, said that one of the things that gets him the most upset about the left is that we ceded the term freedom to libertarians <laughs> and conservatives. Right. Like, the, like they get to define what that term is. <laughs> right. And we, we can never use it because right. they can come up with like Freedom Institute and bullshit libertarian terms mm, right. that are not actually about freedom. And the, it's been defined mm-hmm. as negative freedoms. Yes. So again, it's come up all through almost all of our conversations. Hucksters. About, <laughs> Hucksters. Well, but through all of our conversations, especially the, the Golden Square and what mm-hmm. ought to be essential human rights, that freedom of speech isn't the, the top of the mountain in terms of freedoms, right? There's, there are essential mm-hmm. freedoms uh, even before we even think about And that's the thing is, is we can take the way they view universalism, right? Which they'll say, well, hey, well, we can have all these universal values, but we'll still have inequity. Well, why don't we say, why don't we support diversity, mm-hmm. but still have socialism? Mm-hmm. It's not like they have to be separate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so take that and use it subversively and turn it towards our movement. I mean, here, equation, very simple. We'll just let's, let's, let's make this as simple as possible for, for a moment. Mm-hmm. Capitalism is a universal mm-hmm. that is profit. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> yeah, it does That's have it. a universal. Yeah. Universal. Pro- well, money, profit, the accumulation like of profit. That, that funny, That's it. That, that, that funny line from the, uh, the Adult Swim uh, YouTube clip I think I showed you called the online for-profit university. Oh, it's like, yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. let's profit yeah. together with yeah, yeah. Panera Bread. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. We'll all profit together. Uh-huh. We'll profit off each other. And that's true. Like, you want to profit off everyone. When you go into a, when you go to a, buy some shirts, you want to profit off them it's, by getting reduced price. No matter people's individual politics, this is the thing. Mm-hmm. And this is the, this is, again, this is why there is the brick wall of imagining, mm-hmm. right? The the limit to imagining that capitalism will never go away, right? Because this is this is the universal. Well, how this is this, the dominant how does universal. This feature into synthetic freedom. So well I'm just I'm just saying the break before we get to that, I'm just saying, okay, there's the universal. What would be an antithesis that mm-hmm. is an emancipatory universal? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we need to the suggestion is we need to like not be afraid of universals uh, and they can actually be a useful tool for mm-hmm. emancipatory movements. Mm-hmm. And so they uh, use this term synthetic freedom here in a way to describe what we've been describing, mm-hmm. right? What we've, what we've mapped out in our discussions and in our arguments here of the most essential human, human rights as, as we characterize them, the, the cornerstones. Four, the the four, four most things. essential tracks on the mixtape. Right, right, the four cornerstones of any notion of freedom whatsoever, mm-hmm. uh, food, shelter, healthcare, and education. Mm-hmm. And they don't name those out explicitly in that order or, mm-hmm. or, or in that um, particular arrangement, but uh, more or less uh, the notion, they, de- they define the notion of synthetic freedom as providing the basic necessities of life and expanding social resources and developing technological capabilities, mm-hmm. which you know, mapped onto our, frame, our intellectual framework that we've been sketching out. That's the golden square. And, and these authors are not primitivists. They really do believe in technology like we do. Absolutely, absolutely. So what is formally free versus really free? That's the binary setup for them is yeah. 
when we talk about basic necessities for life, that's what becomes synthetic freedom, and that's what is the basis for what they consider real freedom, right? Uh, not not this like formal negotiation of equality of opportunity, but actual equality, right? And the you know the the they do, however, warn of the dangers of a universalism too. Mm-hmm. That what would be useful, necessary, and actionable uh, for a vision of a better world is to art- articulate a humanism that mm. isn't fully prescribed, right? We also have to give uh, opening, right? Mm. Possibility that the, the, the future isn't fully determined. Mm. And this, I think, is a, is a cognitive hurdle mm-hmm. that folks have when we talk about, even to you introduce the term utopian, or utopia is that there, there's this cognitive hurdle of the assumption of utopia as some fully prescribed mm-hmm. notion, schematic, some, right? Some outlined, f- uh, some fully down to every detail well, of, of a life. We we most people can agree, and especially on the left, of what the values of a utopian society would have. It's a question of that ramping up toward it. Like, what's the mechanisms? What's in the toolbox? What step falls after what step? And and they're not progma- pragmatic about how that's actually going to occur. They don't put a timeline in the book, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And I think that's a benefit of the book. It doesn't put a timeline that you should have these things fall in this order, mm-hmm. um, because that's just silly. Because it's very, it's very easy to to imagine the future for some folks. It's even harder to imagine how it'll happen. Right. But the, you know the the first step that they outline here, or the you know the essential thing that they outline here is that uh, the end of wage labor mm-hmm. that. You know, it's in the title of the book, you know, post capitalism in a world without work. So the argument mm-hmm. is really f- centered around the notions of work and the role of work in, and their whole prescriptions for a uh, list of demands, too, mm-hmm. which we'll get to next here is related to work mm-hmm. and its central role in human life uh, as it's currently designed, uh, but that therefore s- essential to an emancipatory vision, a utopian vision of the world that we might work towards collectively, we have to imagine a world without it. Yeah. Right. And how do mm-hmm. and how do we do that given the current dogma of mm-hmm. Well you, you you can call it the digital aristocracy. So as the time that we're also losing workforce and employment in the proletarian sense, we have massive profits being zoned into San Jose and Silicon Valley. So it's basically like a digital aristocracy. You know, they're they're the digerati. They just, <laughs> they just control the digits of well, the and, body. Well, and moving moving towards uh, implementing straight out forms of feudalism. Mm-hmm. When you talk about the campuses of these digital corporations, We're like creating face, a better Facebook, university like, than what you have at like your Facebook, college. that you just live there entirely yeah. in Facebook all the time. You'll mm-hmm. we'll, we'll we'll provide you everything you can. Well, it's almost like a, a part of the joke that's being extended from the show Portlandia, where one of the characters, Fred Armisen, says like, oh yeah, Portland's a place where young people go to retire. Mm-hmm. They're literally creating these Silicon Valley utopias where everybody goes to retire, kind of made fun of with some good effect in the book by The Circle, Dave Eggers, where they, they're kind of like college campuses mm-hmm. where the most formal aspects of friendship is part of the job. <laughs> right. It's been formalized, right, where right. like, why aren't you socializing after work with us? Which, which really is just... Is a just, cult. Well, it's a cult, but it's also, I mean, <laughs> to take that poison pyramid, mm. um, interlocking mm. mythologies religion. of religion and capitalism, that this is a, a total ownership of, of... This is a notion of totally owning mm-hmm. y- your life. Mm-hmm. The corporation in, owns every mm-hmm. aspect and square inch and moment of You your are life. a beautiful cell for the machinery of capitalism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you might get burnt a little bit, get broken up. It might yeah. be a viral attack, but we'll create a new you. Yeah, and you know they they I like this Arthur C. Clarke quote that opens up the the chapter where they detail a list of specific demands that are part of their mm-hmm. their their framework of their argument, which is Arthur C. Clarke quote is the goal of the future is full unemployment. Mm-hmm. I'm all for that. <laughs> fucking robots yes. fucking take this the is, jobs. This is the part of the book that really heats up for me and has a lot of excitement and genuine purpose. And I think the strongest chapter in the book is these demands, right? Like right. full automation. Be uh, purposeful about this. There's four of them. Mm-hmm. And read them off there. Four demands. Full automation, number one. Mm-hmm. The reduction of the working week, number two. Mm-hmm. Number three, the provision of a basic income. Mm-hmm. And four, the diminishment of the work ethic. Now they call this... The non-reformist reform, which is 
really shitty title. It's the <laughs> it's a kind of sad moment because they got these four well, demands and hey, then they you could have you you could have helped them with the with the words Wordsworth thing, right? Yeah, you could have lent some poetry yeah, to this project. That's and not going to be a rallying cry. We're the non-reformist reformers. Hey, as as we as we take our little invisible project here and we start to mm-hmm. build the think tanks of this. Utopian mm-hmm. future imagining, then maybe we'll have the opportunity Absolutely. to collaborate. And, and we the, hope, and, and you can and it's, lend and it's, that poetic. And it's, you know, it's 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 cotton dressing. I mean, yeah. it, what's good here is these demands are awesome. Right? Yes, like yeah, these yeah. are fantastic. These are, and it's not an anti-technology left utopian imaginarium. Yeah. So it's like, yes, we want full automation. Yeah. Fuck yes. And there's and there's not a clear prescription for what full automation means. And they're open to that. A, so they're open right. to that. Like the moral questions of whether. Children should be raised by AI or robots, or, yeah. uh, or an end of life care. Is that but these are, done by humans or not? These are specifically kinds of things that, in this ecology of organizing and this strategic approach, if we can, the growing call this into together, automation, yeah, right, the growing like, into. Well, are these debates about where, what are the ethical boundaries of? Automation's integration into and our lives, and it's exciting. That's already a win. If we're actually going to have debate that, like how much should we want our life automated, that's already a great debate. But from the start, the premise here and the uh, just the basic notion ought to be in the argument here is that unions, laborers, mm-hmm. wage slaves ought to be demanding shorter work weeks. Mm-hmm. That robots take the jobs. That the drudgery gets turned over to the to the machines that can handle it better. And the irony, of course, is they they note that to actually free the worker, it's best to have those wages rise mm-hmm. or unemployment rise. Mm-hmm. And so, by accepting lower wages and accepting flat wages to protect current health care mm-hmm. expenditures, mm-hmm. that they're actually prolonging. Automation. So automation should have happened much quicker than this, but because oh, yeah. I mean, this is uh, David Clinton, Graeber talks about I mean, this in his article in the Baffler about poetic technologies and bureaucratic technologies. Is that by outsourcing with global outsourcing, we've essentially reduced the innovation for automation. So the technologies for automation have been reduced because we could just go to profit, and profit is doesn't even care about the environment. We'll fucking have plastic bottles <laughs> um, made in China to yep. be consumed here and never get recycled back. And, no. But we'll have them. We'll have chicken cut up and processed in China now washed in with chlorine. the new laws and washed in chlorine because it's simply more profitable at this point to use global trade networks mm-hmm. that reduce worker wages and create uh, negative solidarity. Mm-hmm. So its purpose at this point is that unions are in some sense blocking full automation, which is to the benefit of workers, mm-hmm. right? Is that it? Ought, well, it ought to be. Oh, yeah, it ought to be. And if and, and so if, we should feel maybe ambivalent about. Yeah, I'm at Ralph's and I'm going to use the automated checkout line. But we're like, fuck, that's a shitty job, anyways. Yeah. Let's get rid of it. That should. That, nobody should have to. It will. It will, that it will put. Job. It'll put more tinder on the fire for uh, basic income movement for yeah. you know those kinds of things. But so, I think importantly, these four demands that they list here around the realm of work. Mm-hmm. Go all they go. They work together. They're, oh, they, they they're, work inter, together. they're interdependent. So once again, full automation, the reduction of the working week, the provision of a basic income, and the diminishment of the work ethic. So like along with ideology. along with demanding full automation, we the wage slavers of the world should unite to also demand a shorter work week. Their notion of an immediate demand in this regard is to fight for a three day weekend, but. Whatever the particulars of that, it should be this classical, you know, it's really a reclaiming of this classical leftist progressive fight and, for a shorter work week for the same amount of pay. And these four demands aren't in any kind of chronological order, but I do think they're putting an emphasis on number one, full automation, is that, yeah. that we have to stop fighting about automation. We have to actually embrace automation, and that should be the, the creed de core is that we embrace automation. That's, I think, why they put it number one, even though these four demands aren't a process step orientation in terms mm-hmm. of its structuring. They're just things that all have to happen together. Mm-hmm. But certainly, you know, if you want full automation, you have to also take apart the work ethic, right. the mythology so, of the work ethic. And, you know, before that, the third one there, if you have, if we get, can increase automation in a democratic way, mm-hmm. in a liberating mm-hmm. way. So increased a- automation to liberate us further, uh, decreased demand for wage hours, so mm-hmm. shorter working hours and shorter working weeks, we, we then have more free time. Mm-hmm. 
but to buffet that with a basic income. So to build out, we we need a, like a Facebook page called SS for all, SS for all, right? Social Security for all. Like, mm. I mean, we we're talking You're about right. Medicare for all, but where's the SS yeah, for all? Yeah, why don't we adopt? Why don't we adopt the? Let's S- create a fucking Facebook page. <laughs> okay, there SS we go. for all. Let's yeah. universalize well, Social Security. I don't know. I, I, that, I wouldn't use SS. Be wary of this acronyms because you get into. It's just abbreviation. It's I know, not an but uh, SS uh, well, there's other connotations, other <laughs> abbreviations for other things. Oh, whoops! Yeah, yeah there you go. Watch uh, your. Yeah, <laughs> uh, quick, uh, I'll quick. put. I'll put. A, I'll, I'll. I'll tell my unconscious to put away the tiki Ex- um, flames. Fuck, right here. Fuck, and I, yeah, this. Uh, <laughs> let's be clear about this. Social security for all. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think the this fourth part here, the diminishing of the work ethic, is probably the most culturally significant of this collection of demands mm-hmm. and the most difficult to overcome because it is the most inscribed by the neoliberal ideology mm-hmm. and normalized by the hegemonic worldview oh. currently. Are you talking about the work ethic aspect? The work ethic. Yeah, and that's underneath the poison pyramid of capitalism, right? Exactly. Is that what keeps capitalism going is that you get what you deserve based on your work ethic. Like, mm-hmm. As if somehow I worked harder than a migrant farmer in New Mexico, which is entirely bullshit. Mm-hmm. Right? There's no way yeah, t- yeah, t- I work harder. Because number one, I'm going to have most of my body left in 10 years, and a migrant worker isn't. Mm-hmm. Right? So let's stop with this idea about, about work ethic and working hard, and somehow you deserve the money you get. Because I can tell you, I don't think CEOs make... 430 times the average labor of a regular person. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is about navigating the, the, the matrix of power and profit to, to benefit yourself at ridiculous levels that mm-hmm. aren't really making you happy. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and the, what do you think of the, um, the reduction of the working week? I thought that was interesting, the part where it talked about how John Maynard Keynes' comment about a 15 hour mm-hmm. work week by 2030 yep. was actually just not an original idea, it was yeah. actually something that was part of the conversation. Oh, yeah. It was a, a common, yeah, yeah, common is- idea. And it wasn't something he came up with. But the notion of, I want to think the author is Lafargue. Lafargue, Lafargue has a, the idea of the three-hour day of work. Yeah, yeah. three-hour you know? work day. So we're looking at some good stuff, right? So we, we, you know, that's, that's a notable way of living this is a life. Like, yeah, these are, not new, this is, these are not new ideas. This is, the, this is what, in the relationship to human lives, this mm-hmm. is what technology's role ought to be. Yeah, primarily and the, Europe, is to is to relieve us from drudgery. Yeah, and European Union, especially France, was trying to move to a thirty-five hour work week. Now Germany has the best work hours, I think thirty-six, for and they get paid forty hours. But France was trying to move to a thirty-five or thirty. I don't remember. But they're saying this would hurt the competitive value of France's economy against the rest of the world. So it's once again the race to the bottom. Fuck. Yeah. So when st- nation states try to implement these policies, they're reminded by but, these think tanks that it's going right. to reduce productivity. Right. And That brings up another good point, I think, which is not necessarily highlighted in their argument, but that it's not just that the think tanks and the op-eds and the professors and this whole ecology of implanting the ideologies of uh, and the ideas of neo- neoliberalism into the culture and into the, into the leaders, into political and policy mm-hmm. um, leaders had an endpoint, right? It's, it's continuing, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's an ever, ever continuing mm-hmm. sort of effort to reinforce these notions to, mm-hmm. to always buffet up the cage. And this is what I think, you know, both the authors have a good job at with Doug Henwood on Behind the News is saying like, of course, um, if we have UBI, we want to make sure that we keep the existing welfare state. We're not going to use it as a way to cut under that. Yeah, this was an important thing I gleaned from it. The, for my first reading of the book was their very necessary warning about universal basic income mm-hmm. as a idea that is gathering steam and uh, conversations are building around is that there's a danger in UBI if it's used as a replacement mm-hmm. of the welfare state then it's really a libertarian dystopian oh, tool, oh, yeah. right? That instead of right providing a, you know, instead of providing a floor for everyone, it lowers the floor. It well, it enforces a ceiling, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. If it's the wholesale replacement of all of our mm-hmm. social welfare programs, then it's then it's like the most you can get instead it's of still the start in, of what you get. It's still interesting to me because. Even in the dystopian end of UBI, it still has more potential for revolutionary action because everybody's getting the same pay. 
So there's a powerful working solidarity. You have positive solidarity. So even in the, if it does go to that dystopian angle, mm-hmm. there's still a, there's still a potential for reclamation because people feel a solid connection based on the same wages. Yeah. And that's an interesting argument because this is the kind of solidarity you had with slave uprising is that they were equally exploited. Mm-hmm. And so even in, and they don't talk about this, but even with UBI, it would, I would still find it interesting, uh, not necessarily worse, maybe short-term worse, but long-term better than our current system because everyone has a shared solidarity based on their mutual levels of exploitation. Mm-hmm. So even if right libertarians do take over this shit, mm-hmm. which is why they talk about UBI as emancipatory and why the left better talk about UBI and be part of that negotiation and debate. Otherwise, Absolutely. they dominate it. I think yeah. that's the important point that they mention is like, if the left walks away from UBI, we give the floor to the right libertarians and capitalists. Right. Right. Yeah. Because they, they'll, they'll acknowledge that you don't essentially have capitalism anymore if you don't have a proletariat. And this is why, you know, Peter Fraze talks about in Four Futures, which is why capitalism will ultimately end because there's just not going to be a proletarian. A population, right? right. right? There's right. not a proletariat. Right. And that's the basis of modern capitalism, right. is that there is a working wage slave component to the society. And that this UBI is something we have to do to orientate it towards a propulsive Star Trek future, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so definitely, this is what's great about them. They're not, they're not techno-feudalists. They're not primitivists. They're accepting of UBI as a kind of radical aim. And it's important to remember that most union organizing and trade unionism in the 1960s and 70s, or even earlier, wanted to get rid of work, especially when they saw how technology developed post-World War II. Uh, most trade unionists wanted to get rid of work entirely. Mm-hmm. And this, uh, suddenly, everybody's like an, on the amateur hour of, of political mm-hmm. visions because <laughs> most unions want to praise work. They don't want to actually create a system where we get eliminated. Yeah, and it's hard to see how a movement for building support for and creating policies to implement UBI mm-hmm. broadly don't work hand in hand mm-hmm. with a developing notion of the work ethic, like a transformation mm-hmm. and, and an, a break away from this mm-hmm. marriage to the mm-hmm. conventional notion of the work ethic. Because as long as we value our sacrifice in our jobs primarily, then we're not going to be open to the notion of being freed from work. Mm-hmm. And, this is, and this is good because the, when it talks about UBI, it also talks about it the way that Peter Fraze does in For Futures, which is that it decommodifies Decommodify labor. They actually labor. mentioned yeah. the phrase too, which is exciting. And then also that, that it's a virtuous circle, mm-hmm. that by having UBI, you get rid of shitty jobs because people won't take it because mm-hmm. the price will go up so much that they won't even bother due to the shitty job. Right, that uh, and pushes the, wages up for exactly, shitty jobs. Exactly, and the, yeah. the jobs that are good, you still have to incentivize that, so those wages go up. So right. it creates a perpetual movement towards full and, automation. And, 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 and introduces mobility. Yeah, right? I love that idea that it mentioned, because I haven't heard of UBI in that way, That because I would think that it would just pay shitty jobs better, but it's like, no, 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 we just automate that shit because that's what's actually happening right now in California with Trump America, it's hard to get migrants to come up to California now because they're, they're, the paranoia and hysteria about migrants are such that nobody's coming up. And so California has a lack of uh, field workers, mm-hmm. uh, migrant farmers. And so their, their wages are going up. And uh, I have a friend that's uh, got a degree in physics and mechanical engineering, and he's creating a harvesting machine for grapes, which is unheard of. Right for vineyards, mm-hmm. and if that goes, man, that is that's that's shocking. That's amazing, and we should both feel sort of sad that these jobs are being eliminated because, in the short term, it is painful for people not to have work, but long term, it creates a tinder fire mm-hmm. for full automation and basic income. Mm-hmm. And I, I love the fact that they introduced the idea that we would just increase the rate of automation by having UBI. Right. And I, I had never thought about until reading oh, yeah, the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. That's great. Yeah. And, you know, the, that we should celebrate the right to be lazy. The whole point of having technology was to work less, not to be hounded by our boss from our cell phone to get emails from, you know, my students on the weekend, right? Mm-hmm. So when, when does my weekend happen? Because, mm-hmm. you know, you want to break from work so you can forget that you actually do work. So, you know, they want to change that to, like, you have a right to be lazy. They don't mention... I, what I thought was weird in this discussion is like how this would reduce systemic forms of racism and prejudice. I don't think right. Feminism. I mean, they brought up feminism I mean, and like how but, it's essentially it's, a feminist thing. But it's such thing. an important thing because because no longer can you attack welfare 
because everybody's getting the same amount of welfare well, through UBI. This is where it becomes a big tent kind of idea mm-hmm. because it's emancipatory in all kinds of fronts mm-hmm. uh, across all mm-hmm. intersections health, of identity. Mental health stress. Uh, yeah, across all intersections of identity. This is an, a, a potentially emancipatory direction and, mm-hmm. and, and policy idea. I guess this is fo- focused on post work, but one of the things that did bother me with this conception is that that we'd all be able to afford where we're living with these arrangements, which is it doesn't really talk yeah, about property. A, no, there's right? a there's a lot of like again as you've been it's about work as I, you've I been bringing that. bringing up yeah. again and again. There's a, there's a lot left out here, and if we look at the argument of the book and trying to build a, a strategic long term vision for the left and mass populist movement, and of, again their their reading of class not being today at least an, an overarching big tent identity, collective identity notion that can motivate, that can that can build momentum mm-hmm. uh, among the populace, that it is kind of odd that this is all focused around work exclusively mm-hmm. to and leaves out so many other things. Yeah. Like leaves out healthcare and leaves yeah. out the mm-hmm. uh, destruction of the doesn't planet. Ta- doesn't tackle the golden square. Doesn't, right? doesn't talk about money and politics and, and all of these things. But I think this is where you can, again, we can see, however, returning to last week's discussion, Mm -hmm. the slingshot seven, that if we think about exactly these types of aims of of thinking long term, strategically Mm -hmm. opening up the cage, right? How do how do we Mm -hmm. get more space in that rabbit cage? That rabbit cage. Well, here's exactly in line with that: the slingshot seven again, the universal single payer healthcare, universal basic income. Renewable energy mm-hmm. project to fight climate crisis, demilitarization of the military and police, tuition-free education, money out of politics, and a fifteen-dollar minimum wage. There we get to, I think, a set of ideas that build upon this focus on work mm-hmm. and incorporate, mm-hmm. you know, the mm-hmm. focus on work into a broader appeal set of uh, ideas. Yeah, but the 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 danger of that, of course, is how do you focus on these and what strategy? Because if you combine this with their four demands plus my demand, which is money out of politics, <laughs> well, money you start apart sounding is like, in there. oh yeah, it is a part of the seven. So let's just say these seven demands with my ultra focus on money and politics and these four demands, you're starting with a giant list that kind of sounds like Occupy Wall Street's attempt to come up with well, a series of gotta, demands. We gotta, this is why we got to, this is the discussions we got to have. Yeah. Right? This is where, where we got, and they make the point here that there needs to be one, they don't, they don't call out anything in, in particular, mm-hmm. but they say there needs to be one thing that mm-hmm. all of these other things can fight. Yeah, in, in, initially at least, there needs to be one idea that uh, addresses all of these things mm-hmm. that needs to be part of. Um, and this is what's push. necessary that the Slingshot Seven doesn't really deal with fully. I mean, other than UBI section, is that we have to confront work, mm-hmm. and that that left doesn't have a conversation of that. Mm-hmm. It's like. It just assumes work is always going to be there and that work is necessarily part of any type of economic order. And I think, once again, in fairness to the authors, they've got a lot on their plate just to deal with work. It's a huge concept. Oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think that's where the four demands are located within the nature of work. Mm-hmm. Right? It's called inventing the future, but it also says demand full automation, demand universal basic income, and demand the future for us all. Right? So th- this is the kind of thing. So, yeah, in fairness, these are quibbles. And, like, yeah, it's it's... 183 pages, I think, before footnotes. So, yeah, there could have been spaces to add these in. And as an academic, we're always supposed to look at the shortfalls of it. But but I think those four demands are wonderful in this chapter, and it's the strongest chapter to me. Mm-hmm. So getting into how to move into the space mm-hmm. of learning the lessons, incorporating mm-hmm. the lessons from the neoliberal project. Seeing what we fail at, seeing, seeing what, what our fa- demands are. And, and adjusting accordingly, they begin to into the discussion of also how hegemonic project mm-hmm. uh, can be emancipatory because it's not just a strategy for those who are in power to govern, but a strategy for the, all of the marginal parts of society well, to in, in, transform Yeah, and chapter seven is called a new common sense because it has to be new because the common sense is rise all boats, right, neoliberalism, right. And this is the, the work ethic. This, this is common sense. So we have to create a new common right. sense. So this is the basic, this is the real hard work of their prescription for getting towards a future is to really transform society from the ground up. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> not simple, not clear, a very complex project 
Like this mm-hmm. is this is can you? There's not really a more massive project mm-hmm. that you could imagine, really, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of human cohabitation. Besides, <laughs> well, transform, they, trans- yeah, exactly. They definitely leave like society. sexuality and domestic aspects open to that, and they say that once again by achieving these ends, these four demands. We allow a kind of new malleability to explore mm-hmm. what humanity will be, mm-hmm. right? It doesn't assume humanity as a, an essentialist configuration. They mm-hmm. say, okay, these things allow for a reconfiguration of our ideas of humanness. Mm-hmm. Where do you want to go with that? Oh, I just, just would, I would just say, so to do that, to get to the point where we can have debates on more exciting things, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's the whole thing. If we can debate how much automation we have, we're already a better place. Right. Because we can actually choose what we want in our life rather than being relegated by a capitalist machinery. You know, the means of production are in our hands and we get to decide how the, it cultivates our notions of freedom. And so I think the new common sense chapter is good in some ways. Like once again, I think I, I'd said this is where the chap the chapters that one of the ones that falls short to me is like the plausibility aspects of these things, like where does the money come for these things? But you know, one thing we can get to that as we yeah, go again, the parts. I think that's this is again. You're just pointing out another uh, referred to again as uh, where they didn't fill it all in, which is where we need to have discussion. Yeah, about. Yeah, but exactly, I, I think like this is really not. Difficult. I don't think this is an academic critique of something they left out. I think plausibility is part of the aim of this chapter. No, no, I agree. Yeah. I agree. There, yeah. there's, there's. Um, they kind of wheel the circle house with phrases that don't necessarily gravitate toward actual tactics. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing to do, though, I think, given that, is to like, okay, let's talk about actual tactics. How do we, yeah. how do we start to build this ecology yeah, of and, organizations to and, and this is where, build, once again, I'm going to pull re- out my rebuild. hobby horse, which is if you want universal basic income, I can't imagine UBI happening before... Uh, public that, financing. No, uh, that's fine. I think you're jumping. There you will go again. Jumping well, well, ahead. No, no, I'm not jumping ahead. No, 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 no. Follow what I'm saying, though. Okay. Is that okay? Even to have the discussions, to build the spaces where th- we can have the debates, mm-hmm. right? Without falling into this bickering, so sectarian, you know, paper mm-hmm. anarchist Facebook page mm-hmm. fly swatting. Have, where do we strategize? Where and how do we have the spaces to build new media and to build new intellectual organizations mm-hmm. and to build stronger and new labor organizations. Think tanks and popularizing economics, right? So it talks about how everyone should know more about economics and that we should be as literate in economics as we are reading a a book on child development. This is before any specifics about the particular policy prescriptions and particular visions of the future, mm-hmm. how do we even get together? Well, it's almost to it's almost sub functions. It's almost sub demands of the demands because right. these are the demands to get to the demands, and that's once again my problem with this chapter is it's it's the, the demands for the demands. Well, and who, who's even going to have the the degree of freedom to participate in this? Mm-hmm. These first initial steps yeah. of this bigger and project. It's the same. It's the same argument internally that they talk about with folk politics is. Horizontalism was about who had surplus time to organize and actually experience democracy. Right. right? right. What, what, wa- what wage privilege do you have right. to suddenly go to a protest in the middle of a workday? So I think if you look at this, and we can go through these, the aspects of what needs to be created to create that common sense. So I think in general, those are good. My problem is, once again, is like, where's the money come from? Uh, where's, well, money in, where's money in politics? Because I... I feel like I, you know. No, I know you're jumping to money and politics. When what I'm talking about, if I'm mm-hmm. talking about is you and me. Yeah. And everyone else, all of our comrades. Where do we have the time? Where do we have the resources mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. start up a think tank? Mm-hmm. If that was the yeah. direction we, we wanted to go, fund me Kickstarter. I, I mean, mean yeah. look, we're doing our absolute best just to keep this and, and this activist, ship afloat of doing a, doing a, a fucking simple actual podcast. Actual activists tend to have the least amount of money. They don't all work for NGOs. Yeah. So they they want they have all the ideas, but none of the access to capital. Right. And I I could have dinner and beer with activists and get way more ideas than a, your local politician, but they have no capital. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's the plausibility aspect that right. I talk about. I mean, I think I, I am. I was excited, and I, I said I would mention this earlier, so I'll mention it now. I was ex- in this space of progressive politics and think tanks. Is uh, Matt Brunig actually mm-hmm. just recently uh, launched, uh, funded through mm. crowdsourcing, launched a, a think tank 
uh, called People's Policy Project, 3P. It's a great term. Um, that is an anti-capitalist sort of economic policy think tank. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's just him at this point, but hopefully with more more funding that they'll, we'll leave a link to this, to, to the website and the uh, Patreon. And we can that. link you to uh, Jacob and interview with Matt Bernig as well. So he talks right. about some of these initial days come up in that podcast. Yeah. So um, closing it out, they give their prescription for strategy to build power, to create a new common sense, to open up the space of what is what is and, possible. And to wind, that, and to wind into the introduction, we should say he talks about Antonio Gramsci's notion of hegemony, mm-hmm. right? And he uses the phrase to create a new hegemony or a counter hegemony. Mm-hmm. And hegemony was the notion of why didn't the revolution happen, right? Well, like that naturally we should have arrived at a social state, what impeded that? And so the notion of hegemony becomes the idea of mediation, consolidated media, uh, the, myth, the myth of the work ethic. This becomes part of the hegemony that mm-hmm. allows the system of capitalism to exist. Mm-hmm. My problem, once again, in this chapter is that hegemony is really featured primarily through entertainment culture. So what I'd call, once again, the entertainment distraction complex, EDC, right? So that the EDC is the thing that's preventing us from actually organizing against the horrors of the physical world. The and, electric daisy carnival? <laughs> that's what you said jokingly on the phone. But yeah, EDC, whatever. I, uh, my EDC <laughs> would be bigger than their fucking EDC. Um, mm-hmm. but, but, but once again, and besides, people die at those things. They do. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to actually save people from yeah, dying yeah. with m- mm-hmm. my critique of EDC. There you go. But maybe I'll just have a photo and article about EDC <laughs> and say, go. I'm actually not talking about this. <laughs> and so that, that blocks the ability to create movements, social movements, right? He talks about the, a populist movement. Well, number one, we can't get number one, number one, if we don't have mass, some number one. confrontation with our addiction to... To entertainment. Our addiction to entertainment is a problem. Quite, quite the catch-22 we're in. Mm-hmm. This fucking cage. That if, if it's possible, we should try to create mass popular movements that are more exciting than Game of Thrones. This, is, this would be a good uh, direction for us to go in, Matt, uh, in future episodes, uh, if not right away, then eventually to take up these problems. The, yeah. the, these, these spaces that they left They're, out. They left out, yeah. The, that like, okay, great. Cool, with you most of the way, good idea, lessons learned with you. Take, oh, I mean, we're point, with them point, We're with point, them all the way. Yeah, yeah point, I think, point yeah. taken, but ha- okay, what do we do yeah. to, to actually mm-hmm. build that? I mean, we've got to spend some time. We, gotta, we, we have to talk about, if you want a populist movement, what are people currently doing with their time, mm-hmm. as limited as it is? I'm yeah. not saying Americans are lazy. I mean, we, the, the book, as well as many other sources, will cite the average work week for an American is 47 hours a week. So it's not that they're not working. And if you include all the other things like brushing your teeth and shaving when you don't want to shave and getting in a car for shitty traffic, God knows an eight-hour workday is much longer than an eight-hour workday. So they have three points or, or three things that they prescribe here, which is a ma- one, a mass populist movement, two, a healthy ecosystem of organizations mm-hmm. we've been talking about, and three, an analysis of points of leverage. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think here's where they uh, alluded to a little bit earlier, where they point out that one particular demand or struggle needs to come to stand for the mm-hmm. rest. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't prescribe, like I said, they don't prescribe mm-hmm. what that is or could be. Mm-hmm. I mean, we could imagine here in the States, uh, they, currently that could be healthcare mm-hmm. uh, and universal right single-payer right healthcare. Right now, that's probably would be my first thing to And And I would say to, to anyone organizing right now is like, discard your personal fetish if you don't think it has a potential to be a big tent movement. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying don't care about those issues, but realize that if we can gravitate towards big tent issues like Medicare for all or money out of politics or public financing, that we can... We can create those massive, massive, massive popular movements where it's not individual silos um, mm-hmm. that are divorced from each other. Yeah. Continuing on here, their point is that we we have to think about points of leverage mm-hmm. uh, to use um, our the weak meta- metaphors, yeah. right? The, in the cage, where are the weak points in the cage that we can op- open in up and cage. widen this cage, this so rabbit we can cage? Shit outside of that rabbit so we can cage. Shit out shit in the box. grass. Yeah. That they aren't. Today they aren't the same weak points that they may have been mm-hmm. historically because they may have been strong points for the opposition at one point. Right? right. That we don't have the power of labor 
mm -hmm. um, in an organized way that unions mm -hmm. are all but non-existent these days. And so those classical points uh, in the struggle between labor and capital have all but disappeared. Or, and so we have to experiment. We have to mm -hmm. be creative. Anything, we have to be very, even more strategic and pointed in, and laser focused well, in finding there is this. there is a there is a, a, a gap and an opening which is that you know the the socialist revolution won't be the proletariat it'll be the unproletariat mm -hmm. so we have lots of people that are underemployed or yes. unemployed and if that's the case especially underemployment we can get people to gravitate towards these social movements because of the inequities then we have this surplus time that can be corralled and in, corralled into a movement mm -hmm. and so I think underemployment is an area of where we can actually use that as a strength for UBI. And th those, that's an example of a weak point. So I'd say we would typically think like, oh yeah, well someone unemployed is going to be too ashamed to organize or get involved. But I met several, several people at Occupy. Now they weren't all unemployed, but some of the most active members were able to be actively involved because they had no other options, right? Mm -hmm. They had surplus time, but no means of survival. And so you, you can use that if you can make something narcotic about a populist movement. And I, I'm glad that they put a mass populist movement as number one. And I think it's what they do with these demands. They're yeah. not chronological, yeah. but they obviously put the number one slot there as mass popular movement. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to have to continue this thread for quite yeah. a while here. And, and, I, and I think, like, I, like I've mentioned a few times throughout the discussion, there are not only some other, other books that, we'll, and mm -hmm. that we'll, we'll read that follow certain threads of these arguments, and, but we got to build... Off of this, mm -hmm. like uh, this mm -hmm. is a great starting for point, for, I think, for a lot of discussions that we'll continue mm -hmm. to have throughout the life of the podcast. Hopefully, at some point, we'll have both the authors on to discuss mm -hmm. these ideas and new and evolving ideas. And possibly with us. bring up uh, since this was published in 2015. Possibly bring up w new ways that they are looking at this old text. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, how how things have changed since the publishing of this text. So. We need your support, though, to get us to a place where the, all of these things are, are possible for us in this project, in this podcast, so that we can have guests mm -hmm. on, so that we can continue so to So link our website on this. your social networking page, leave us a comment, go on to our website and tell us what you want the future to be, right, with an audio file from your iPhone, and we can attach it onto one of our podcasts. Like this one here from Dwayne... Use. Use. Dwayne Use. The future should be like Star Trek, but a little bit less sexism. <laughs> nice and succinct there. <laughs> I think that encapsulates it's The a most lot. noticeable gap in that utopian future <laughs> yeah. is those hella short skirts in the show. Yeah. Um, I, I'm assuming as such they get paid equally, but someone get, has to wear less clothes. Yeah. So Matt mentioned this very briefly, but to get in touch with us, to help support the podcast, please... Subscribe on iTunes, mm -hmm. tell your friends, mm -hmm. give us a rating, a, re a review, hit up the website, thefutureisamixtape.com, visit facebook.com slash thefutureisamixtape, thefutureisamixtape on Instagram, at futuremixtapes on, on Twitter. Twitter. Mm -hmm. And you, you can, can leave a review on Apple as well, too. So. Well, I mentioned that. Were you, were you not listening I again? Wasn't, I yeah, wasn't. he tunes out sometimes. and. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. <laughs> There's a problem there. Uh, you distracted me, me from what I was going to do. Make me more than Jesse's monkeys, basically. You distracted me. Make me more than Jesse's monkeys. distracted me from what I was going to do. If I do that, does it continue to piss you off? It does. Okay. Uh, what I was going to say is also just email us directly. Mm -hmm. The uh -huh. future is uh -huh. a mixtape at gmail.com. And hey, if you're in the LA area, you're working on emancipatory projects. These ideas we've been discussing resonate with you. Let's let's talk. Let's uh, let's uh, get you in on a recording mm -hmm. and let's uh, dive deeper into these directions and how we can mm -hmm. build solidarity, and build a popu mass populist movement without mixing falafel and popsicles. <laughs> okay, we'll be sure not to do that. Don't mix them up. Thanks for the advice, Matt. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Mm -hmm.